Hello, I'm Mark McKee, the Managing Editor for the Missouri Review. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the third of three videos celebrating the winners of the 29th annual Jeffrey E. Smith Editor's Prize. In the before times, we would fly the winners into Columbia, Missouri for a reading and reception, complete with hors d'oeuvres, alcohols, a photo booth, a little live music to set the mood. And now 2020 is a flaming garbage barge of nope. So welcome to our pivot. On a more serious note, we here at TMR hope that you and yours are safe, healthy, and secure, and we are grateful for the opportunity to host and disseminate this adaptation we've thrown ourselves into, which at least has the happy capacity to be shared widely with no cost but time. Let me assure you, though, that this is time you'll be happy to part with. Joining us this virtual eve will be Jennifer Anderson, the 2019 winner in nonfiction for the trailer will be introduced by our associate ed editor, Evelyn Summers. Jennifer Anderson's The Trailer is an essay about human connections, about community and mutual responsibility. It asks the ages old question, who is my neighbor? And the corollary, what, if anything, is my obligation to them? These questions are presented with utter clarity as the essayist shows us how an unasked for annoyance a rundown camping trailer abandoned on her family property becomes a festering long-term headache. At first, just a material issue, but ultimately a human one that points to larger problems in Anderson's community of Lewiston, Idaho, and the entire country, epidemic addiction and homelessness, the inadequacy of resources to combat these issues, and the perpetual tension between the need for compassionate outreach and the often conflicting question of public safety. These are tragedies and tensions that we can predict will only balloon into a greater crisis in the current pandemic and its aftermath. But to speak honestly as a reader, what first drew me to Jennifer Anderson's essay was a detail tangential to the primary narrative, her passing reference to delivering for Meals on Wheels with her father. A deep chord resonates in that discovery, for this reader at least. An abiding theme in the trailer is family. The abandoned trailer of the title takes on an almost emblematic status as an affront and a threat to the essayist's family, a threat specifically to her aging father, whose workshop is across from the piece of land where the trailer is parked. As she illuminates the social and moral complexities of an impossible situation, Anderson, once a troubled teen and drug user herself, is always aware of the ground she stands on. If not for the advantages she can claim, the support, stability, at times intervention of a close and caring family, she might be that homeless woman squatting in an abandoned trailer and trying to get her life together or given a different circumstance, you might be that woman, or I might be, which is why this essay matters. Jennifer Anderson is an assistant professor at Lewis Clark State College in Lewiston, Idaho, where she is the faculty advisor for the college's student-run literary journal, Talking River Review. Her creative nonfiction has appeared in the Colorado Review, the Cimarron Review, and Brevity, and previously in the Missouri Review, among other places. She also makes documentaries with her husband, Vernon Lott. Their most recent project, Hashtag Mona Lisa, is an 11 hour experimental documentary that immerses viewers in the pre-COVID-19 museum experience. Tonight, we welcome Jennifer and I'll let her take the floor. Thank you, Evelyn, for that wonderful um, introduction. And thank you all for having me here tonight and for setting up this event. It's an honor to be here. I'm going to read a passage from the opening of my essay, The Trailer. Sometime in late March, the camper trailer appears, 15 feet long with a crude black and green paint job discarded on our property behind Starbucks, Little Caesars, and the AT&T store. It sits parallel to one of the metal outbuildings my father rents from my sister-in-law, my husband, and me for his woodworking projects. The front end tongue jack balanced on a block of wood as if someone has planned to set up camp in our gravel parking lot. Zebra print 
curtains flap in the open window, the door dangles from one hinge. I don't remember exactly when my father tells me about it or when I first mention it to my husband and his sister. My mother-in-law, the actual owner of the property, has recently unexpectedly died from complications related to diabetes. Don't worry, my father assures me, I'll get rid of it. He reports it to the police who write down the license plate number and tag the street side window with a bright pink sticker. After a few weeks pass with no response, he calls again. An officer tells him the phone number linked to the plate is out of service. There is nothing they can do. The city does not tow abandoned vehicles from private property. Where in the hell do our taxes go? He asks me. Out of Idaho's 44 counties, our north central town of 33,000 at the confluence of the Snake and Clearwater Rivers, touted as the gateway to Hell's Canyon, pays the third highest property tax rate in the state. And for what, he complains. He calls the local salvage yard. They will take it only if he removes the holding tank, refrigerator, and stove. He also has to haul it to them and pay a fee. He refuses to pay. I do too. So I don't even bother telling my husband or his sister. It's a matter of principle, my father and I say to each other more than once. The city should help us. Why are we responsible for someone else's trash? We consider hitching the trailer to my father's truck and moving it into the street. Then the city will have to deal with it, but are hesitant to actually follow through. My father's phone number is on police record. If anything, we rationalize, he'll receive a citation. So the trailer stays, and over the next year, a clutter of feral cats takes up residence cascading from the window, an orange, white, and black rainbow when they hear my father's truck before vanishing beneath a web of blackberry bramble. Now March has come around again, and my father tells me that someone has moved in. I don't believe him at first. He's 73, suffers from intermittent blurry vision related to dry eye, and refuses to wear glasses. Who'd sleep in there, I ask. I found a pipe by the tire, he tells me, when I was doing weeds. He sprays the puncture vine a few times a year. Otherwise, it spreads into the gravel lot and takes over everything. What kind of pipe? That should hold back those damned goat heads for a while, he continues. I track them inside my truck, everywhere. Dad, what kind of pipe? A glass one, used for drugs. What kind of drugs? Meth? Weed? How in the hell would I know? My father and I have lived in Idaho our entire lives. Our houses sit only two miles apart, but we still somehow inhabit different worlds. I teach English composition at the state college in town. He's a retired paper mill foreman. At 14, I first smoked weed from a soda can in the bluffs behind my parents' house. I discovered acid the next summer, asking, what does it do? Only after placing the white tab on my tongue. An insecure teen with a self-destructive streak, I huffed, snorted, and smoked everything I could. If someone had offered heroin or meth, I would have eagerly tried it. When I spent the night at friends' houses, I brought alcohol and washed out hairspray bottles, a rank blend of whiskey, vodka, and schnapps stolen from my parents' liquor cabinet. I convinced my friends to drink with me, then head downtown to wander the streets and look for someone to pick us up in his car take us for a ride. My father's priorities as a teen ran a completely different course. He wanted only to fish, to wander the grassy banks of the narrow St. Mary's River with his fishing rod and tackle, to cast into a deep hole and wait for a cutthroat to strike. But he grew up the son of a sawmill owner. When he was 14, his father woke him the opening day of fishing season by tossing a pair of leather gloves in his face. Get up, he said, you're going to work. My father has never done drugs, not so much as a joint while deployed to Germany during the Vietnam War, though he's told me about the potent German beer. I'm not even sure he knows what acid is. His idea of cutting loose is down in a few brush lights or whiskey sodas and listening to Willie Nelson. It's probably just teenagers, I say, using it for a place to smoke pot. I don't know. The neighbor told me some woman's been staying there. 
The neighbor, a woman in her late 50s, lives across the street in the only house on the entire block, a 1940s bungalow that used to be a tattoo parlor. It's situated between a quilting shop and an empty field inhabited by a skulk of foxes and a few deer. The neighbor called the police about the woman, but they told her they couldn't make the woman leave because the trailer's not on her property. The neighbor also claimed she saw the trailer being dumped a year ago, a white pickup, 4 p.m., in and out of the parking lot so fast that she didn't have time to write down the truck's license number. She called the police then too, but they told her the same story. If the trailer wasn't on her land, there was nothing they could do. The neighbor thinks the woman has a little side business going, he adds. Like what? You know, men coming in and out at all hours, the bra is practically next door. Though I've never looked inside the trailer, I doubt this too. There's the broken door and open window, a year's worth of wind and rain and snow. We live in a valley at the southern end of the panhandle, a banana belt, and our weather generally stays mild. But winter came late and hard this year, a record snowfall of 29 inches in February alone. Now that the temperature is warmed, I imagine black mold flecking the walls, paint peeling from the damp ceiling, and of course the cats, secluded inside, waiting out the weather, the ammoniac odor of urine saturating the floor and sofa cushions each time they've marked the trailer as theirs. It's late April, a Saturday. My father and I stop by the property after we finish our deliveries for Meals on Wheels, a weekly route we've been driving for the past five years. We plan to piece together the white pine dining table he's making me. There are three buildings on the strip of commercially zoned land my husband's family has owned since the 1960s. Two pale yellow shops with leaky roofs that flank an overgrown gully and a sports bar called Work that borders 21st Street, our town's main thoroughfare. Over the years, a series of shady tenants has leased the bar. One man even tacked blankets over the windows in the, of the defunct restaurant in back and moved his bed in. Most months, my sister has to call the current occupant for the rent check, but he eventually pays. The former tenant of the shops, an auto mechanic, is a different story. He squatted there for a year before my mother-in-law served him with eviction papers and changed the locks. He'd also moved in his bed. We all assumed his tools and the two dozen rusted vehicles parked out front would cover the thousands he owed her in back rent, but days later he broke in and took everything valuable, leaving behind only a stack of rotten tires, a dozen drums of oil, and a toilet brimming with a mound of shit hardened to cement. So now my father rents and watches over both buildings, a deal he worked out years ago with my mother-in-law, paying less than he would for a storage shed just enough to cover the property taxes. When he pulls up alongside the trailer, I see the woman's head in the window, then she disappears. I'm going to take care of this right now. I dial the police department's non-emergency number and tell the dispatcher that I need the woman trespassed. The dispatcher says she'll relay the message to the sergeant and he'll get back to me. There, I announce to my father, done. We work on my table while we wait. My father punches holes along the edges of two 15 inch wide boards with a biscuit joiner. I fill the holes with wood glue and football shaped wooden biscuits and we clamp the boards together. I don't need a table, but want one that better fits my small dining room than the vintage one in there now. I still haven't worked out what I'm going to do with the old table. My garage is already packed with furniture, mostly antiques I've collected at estate sales and thrift stores over the years, enough to furnish a second home. 15 minutes go by. A slight man in a brown Carhartt coat, a baseball cap and jeans emerges from the trailer with a smoking chunk of driftwood, one of the logs my father has collected along the Salmon River to use as a base for the end tables he makes and sells at regional craft shows. The man pretends not to see us. He drops the wood alongside the trailer. Hey, I say, walking out of the shop toward the man. You need to leave. My voice wavers. I take a deep breath and swallow hard. This is our property. You don't have permission to be here. Okay, the man says, raising both hands, palms up. Can I at least go get my truck to haul away my stuff? He looks in his early 40s, about my age. 
His submissiveness surprises me. How many times has he been told to put his hands in the air? My father walks over to the man and me. You know, I have thousands of dollars of equipment in here. He is calm as if he's talking to one of his fishing buddies and gestures over his shoulder to where his power saws and belt sanders sit in plain sight next to his 18 foot fishing boat and outboard motor. I don't want anything stolen. Oh, I understand, the man says. I own a lot of expensive tools too. I look at my father as if he's lost his mind. Is he inviting the man to rob him? The man retreats into the trailer and the woman comes out with an empty gallon water jug. She looks straight ahead, pretending not to see us either. She starts walking down the street toward 21st, a street crowded with car dealerships, fast food chains, and payday loan centers. She looks about 30, of average height and build, with shoulder-length sandy brown hair, her jeans and fitted sage green top, at least that's how I plan to describe her to the police, are ordinary. You can't stay here, I call to the back of her head. We're going to tow the trailer away, today. You need to get your stuff out. She glances back at me, smirks, and continues casually down the street. I watch her cross the busy intersection and go into a gas station. We're getting rid of it, today, I repeat to no one. The man sits inside the trailer and my father re has returned to our table making project at the other end of the shop. I look up the number to a towing operation with acres of used auto parts on the edge of town. Now, who are you calling? My father asks. Bernard's, we haven't tried him yet. He's a crook, he says. He tried to charge me $350 for a tow when I broke down upriver only five miles out of town. Good, maybe he'll take a free trailer. As I give the owner of the junkyard the address so he can come take a look, the woman returns with the plastic jug now full of water. She pours a steady stream over the smoking piece of wood, shakes the remaining drops from the jug, caps it and takes it with her into the trailer. Another 10 minutes pass. I listen to the man and woman banging around inside, a familiar sound. When I was young, my family owned a similar trailer and spent most weekends camping along Ponderay Lake or the Clark Fork River. If I closed my eyes, I could almost imagine it's my mother in there, rolling up sleeping bags, converting the beds back into couches. But I don't close my eyes. The woman's bags remain pressed against the rear window. Smoke wafts up from the driftwood. Then I notice the pipe on the ground. I'd assume that my father had thrown it away. Though I never smoked meth, I recognize the long, clear glass stem and charred bulb. My pipe had a metal tip and bowl connected by a red plastic tube where I'd store my weed. As a teen, I carried it with me everywhere, even on camping trips. Each morning, I tell my parents I was taking a walk, then I'd crouch down in the tall grass and smoke a bowl or two. I'd return with a bouquet of purple aster and silvery white money plant or a handful of pine cones for the fire, an offering for our camp. Come afternoon, I'd sneak away with a similar lie. Movement inside the trailer stops. A cat darts across the street. Where's the officer? I ask my father. They're getting ready to leave. Thank you. So I may change my um, direction in midstream here a little bit, Jennifer, and I may know the answer to the question, but here goes. Both of the essays that Missouri Review has published of yours have in different ways explored the tension between individual needs and problems, yours and your families, and how we live alongside and treat the least of these. So my question is, how much does writing an essay like this that is partly confession change your intents and actions? And after having wrestled with the complexities narratively in writing this essay, would you do anything differently if the trailer appeared on your land now? Um, thanks for that question. This is something that I think about quite often. And um, if not every day, quite frequently. Um, and I, I run through various scenarios in my head all of the time. 
Um, what if I had just simply offered um, them to take the trailer? I could have moved it for them. We have a truck. There's a, um, the Hell's Gate um, State Park campground is right on the edge of town. We could have moved it there for them and I could have offered to pay maybe for a month's rent out there for them. Um, there's the, the YWCA in town. I think about, well, maybe I could have tried to put her in touch with them. Um, so there are other things that I think about that I could have done differently. Um, and, and I don't know um, how those scenarios would have played out, but I certainly do um, toss them around. But one thing I am certain of when I think about this and the interaction that I had with the woman and the man both is that I could have been kinder to both of them in my interaction with them. Um, the way our, um, when we did meet with each other a couple of times in that first interaction I talk about, and then subsequently when the police did come to issue the trespass order, um, it, those scenarios, I, I just, I could have been kinder. And, and that's something um, that, that I hope if I'm faced with this again, that the outcome is, is better in that respect. Thank you for that answer. Um, Mark can edit this out, but um, one reason the essay resonated with me in addition was I had uh, many, many years ago came home from a mission trip to discover that my husband had allowed an ex-convict to be living in a car in our yard while we had three young children. And so I was presented with the same tension, you know, my own desire to do good through this mission trip and then you come home and it's right in your yard and what do you do? So, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I'm curious. Uh, so this, you know, you've, you've got this homeless couple moving in and, and threatening the safety of your aging father. And, 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 you know, the results of the essay end up raising all kinds of questions for the reader for, and for you, for you, you yourself about, about issues uh, having to do with addiction and homelessness and social responsibility. Um, and I found that really interesting uh, and I just am kind of curious, I mean, if you can just talk to us about it, place and, and environment is very interesting to me and talk to us about the, the situation in Lewiston. I mean, you're in extreme Western Idaho, you're right on the border, you know, and, and, but still a good ways from someplace like Portland or wh wherever. So describe what the situation was like there then and how it has changed, if at all, since then. Do you have a major, do you have major issues of homelessness there? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so when I was growing up here, um, I was not ever aware of a problem with homelessness in the Valley. Um, you didn't see um, um, people panhandling on corners or anything like that. But um, I would say that about 10 years ago, um, and maybe it was, it, it would be about 10 years ago, I would say after 2008 um, happened. And um, we, we started seeing more people on corners. Um, and this is more not in Lewiston so much as across the river from us in Clarkston. And it's probably just because we are such a small community. Um, Lewiston has about 33,000 people. Clarkston has about 7,000 people. But over right across the river and the bridge is where a lot of people stand because it's just high traffic areas. We don't, we're not, you know, like Portland or Seattle where there are a lot of people. And um, so I started noticing a lot of people and panhandling there, um, as well as to the entrances to say Walmart and you know major shopping places in our community. Um, and um, and gosh, it was probably two or three years ago. The city of Clarkston um, erected signs um, at the entrance to Walmart and also at the entrance or um, by the bridges there to um, discourage panhandling. Um, and um, I write about this in the essay too, these signs that say, 
um, give to a charity, don't you know, support panhandling. And so those, those were erected um, not that long ago. But um, I, I thought about this too, since, since COVID hit um, um, last year, I have not um, personally noticed a lot of change in the number of people that I see um, standing on um, the corners. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not happening um, at a greater rate um, behind closed doors. In a community like ours, I mentioned in the essay how I do deliver for Meals on Wheels once a week, and I regularly see um, people who are living in, we call it North Lewiston, or kind of the truck town area of our community. Um, there are a lot of um, people living in poverty in that area of town in particular in old motels that are quite run down. And I deliver a lot of food to people there on a weekly basis. And that's probably the only meal that they're getting um, for that day. Um, and um, so I don't know that if there is an increase that I would notice it so much out on the street. One thing I do have to say that I've noticed, however, is um, at the college, um, I have um, talked to quite a few students, even this semester, and these students are either um, on the verge of homelessness or are um, or have been there in the past, and that's why they're they're going to school or trying it because they've got to do something. Um, and and I don't know whether it's just students are intimating this more to me now. Um, this is probably a problem that's been there all along. Um, I don't know if it's increased more or not. I, my guess is it has a little bit just in the conversations I had with students who have lost their jobs and who are um, trying to make ends meet. Um, I had a student last semester, for instance, who lost his apartment um, and his job and his unemployment checks, he was waiting, they were so backlogged um, with dealing with that, that he wasn't able to get money. Um, we have a food pantry now on campus, which is a relatively new thing as well. So these little changes that I'm seeing in our community, it's, it's not on a huge scale, but I guess little pockets of change. I don't know if that answers your question or. No, it, it definitely addresses it. And, and I mean, I've just not, I've noticed uh, such, I mean, we're in such delicate times right now um, uh, with, you know, with students the other day, I was inspired to talk to them, in fact, about, about how the times now are reminiscent in many ways of the depression. I mean, you've got major numbers of people who are losing their jobs, losing their place to stay. And, you know, uh, I mean, right today, the airlines are firing, you know, uh, many tens of thousands of people uh, so I was inspired to, to talk to students about books from the Depression era. Henry Roth's Call It Sleep or uh, The Disinherited by Jack Conroy, um, you know, uh, or uh, A.G. and, uh, you know, the book of photography of American photography um, uh, from the 1930s. Uh, I mean, it's, we're, we're in, we're in rough times and your essay is even more relevant now, um, than then. I mean, and so I find that interesting. Enough said. Yeah. Um, it, it is, it, it does seem to be more relevant now, which is, which is really distressing, um, too. And, and speaking of, um, being, you know, inspired to speak to students. Um, I just, um, I offer extra credit to my English 101 students on a weekly basis, and um, I'm trying to help them um, identify social, um, social change through the arts over history. And, um, and I put up Dorothea Lang's migrant mother um, photograph for them um, this week. And so they could maybe see those connections between what's going on right now, as well as, you know, what happened in the thirties during the depression. Yeah. So, so I'm trying to have those conversations too with students. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you both for, uh, for basically maneuvering me right into my question. Um, and thanks again for being here with us, Jennifer, and, and congratulations on, on the well-deserved prize. 
I think what I want to do is to kind of ask a question that expands kind of on Spears. You know, as we've seen the creeping awareness of systemic failure stop creeping and start vaulting, what is it that you think uh, writing can do? I'm not suggesting that it can't be powerful or pivotal or revolutionary, but I guess what I'm wondering uh, is if it's how you see, you know, creative nonfiction and essays mobilizing in the midst of a situation that undermines the premise and the promise of the democratic state. I mean, to put it more simply, here's what I think I mean to ask. How can trying to write about true things help us now? Thank you for that question. Um, um, in answering that, I think I can only speak for myself and what I do um, when I write and in particular say regarding this essay is I wrote this essay um, because I was really struggling with this experience and I needed to work some things out for me. And um, uh, when you get to the end of the essay, you see I haven't really worked those things out and I'm still grappling with those things because they're not easy. Um, they're not easy uh, questions to answer. Um, they're such big questions and big problems with our with our society. But um, if you know it can reach a larger audience, I think you know that's that's great. Um, but I, I guess I'll say this is um, I've been studying and I've been reading um, creative nonfiction for the past twenty years and teaching it and. Um, learning from it and, and I've read a lot of essays um, that have dealt with subject matter, you know, similar to what mine um, uh, addresses and I still um, had this emotional response that I'm really embarrassed about and not proud of um, when I interacted with this couple and I feel um, as if the empathy that I was able to um, come to, um, that only happened through reflection and after the fact. And, and so um, I, I guess I'm still learning from it and I can just speak to, to my own personal experience with, with regards to that. I don't know that that answers your question at all. <laughs> it does, it does. It, uh, I mean, I think one of, the, one of the wise things that you're saying there is that not, they're really, it's, it's difficult to imagine a resolution for any of those um, that isn't just a utopic vision of how things should be. Um, instead, what we get is we get the struggle. We get the work that goes into imagining that and writing helps give that shape, which is, uh, which is, a, which is a forgiveness. Um, all right, I'm gonna pass off to Chris, who has uh, a, perhaps a cheerier um, question? Yeah, I noticed I reread the essay today and I read your author's note in your bio and I noticed, I couldn't help noticing that you made a documentary with your husband, The Act of Becoming, about John Williams' 1965 novel Stoner. And I think all of us here at the University of Missouri sort of would be interested in t having you talk about um, your interest in that novel, but also this project of making movies with your husband. How is that? Um, that, that's a that's a super question. I could, I could talk forever about um, my husband and I and our movie making ventures. Um, we've just finished our sixth documentary. Um, that's the the eleven hour experimental film um, hashtag Mona Lisa. Um, but the the inception for um, the act of becoming actually came about in um, two thousand ten. Um, when we were working on our first documentary, which is called Bad Writing. And my husband, um, and, and I'll just give you a little background on bad writing. Um, my husband, Vern, um, had found this box of um, poetry that he had written um, as a young adult, and he had carefully archived it, and he thought, oh, this is going to be great. This is, you know, I'm, I'm going to revisit this later, and everyone's going to want this poetry because clearly I'm a genius and they just don't understand me yet. 
And he rediscovered this poetry and found out, oh, just how horrible it was. And he was studying creative writing at the time and was just mortified um, thinking, can I ever be a good writer? And so he set out to interview all of these writers about their writing process. And it really is supposed to be an inspirational documentary. It's about a process of self-discovery and of um, um, pretty much all the writers he interviewed said, you know, we all write crap the first time. And, and so um, that's, that's the, the genesis of that. But he was, he was interviewing Steve Almond for the documentary um, when Steve Almond was actually out here and visiting the U of I. And um, after their interview, they were chatting and Steve mentioned um, Stoner and asked if he had ever read it. And we hadn't even heard of this, this novel before. And he says, well, there's your next documentary. And um, so we were intrigued. And so um, we, we got the novel and it wasn't our second documentary. It was actually our fourth documentary. We did a couple of others in the interim, um, but that's, that's where the idea started. And so we were, we were just interested in how this novel from 1965, um, you know, which only sold about 2000 copies and very nearly went out of print, was only kept alive um, by some of um, John Williams's friends and then passed around by grad students and professors, kind of an underground thing. And then um, um, how it was, you know, in the last, you know, 10 years or so became an international bestseller. And we were interested in exploring the how and the why this happened and how this novel is able to connect to so many people. And that connection they experience very much mirrors what happens in the novel. Have you all read the novel, by the way? I'm just, I'm just curious. Um, and there's that, that moment of epiphany for those of you who have read it that Stoner has um, when he's reading the Shakespeare sonnet. And I can't recall off the top of my head which sonnet it is. And he has this moment in the classroom that this is what this is what love is, this is what his life is meant to be, and he falls in love with literature. And um, for many of the readers, um, that's the experience that they have when reading this book also, and that's why they get behind and champion this book. And so um, that, was, that was our goal, is to um, really um, let the um, people who helped resurrect this book tell the story of what this book meant to them and why, and then just the process of, of what happened there. Um, as far as making documentaries with my husband, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, we, we fire each other all the time just because we live <laughs> with each other. <laughs> and, and sometimes, you know, when we're struggling with things, we, we, we quit and then we join again and, and all of those, those silly things. But really it's, it's just true collaboration. We, um, we, we live and breathe this stuff. And so um, we're, we're starting another project here um, pretty soon. Um, that is, is also going to be an experimental film. So we're moving from the less experimental, more traditional documentary. And for some reason we've ended up over here where, um, where we're making 11 hour um, nonfiction films now. Hi, I'm Chris Somerville, TMR's marketing coordinator. And it's my pleasure to thank um, Jennifer Anderson for reading from the trailer this evening and answering our questions about this essay and also her work making documentaries. I'd also like to thank Mark McKee, who I don't know how often he gets thanked, but it's due. He put the series together and they turned out great. And also, I don't know if this is too much personal information, but he lives across the street and he has this wonderful kid that when I walk out the door, he's like, Chris, Hey, Chris, what are you doing? We're Spear. <laughs> and it makes me feel very, very cheerful. And I think we all need to feel cheerful. Also, um, what makes me feel cheerful is working for and reading for this magazine. And as you can tell, we just get the best work. And right now it's really, um, you know, a great, great thing to have a worthy project like this. So I think I can speak for everyone that we're thankful for the magazine, we're thankful for our authors, our submitters, and our subscribers. 
So again, thanks.